one of the things that I like about science fiction is it's not just a way of imagining a better world. It's also a way of imagining how we get to a better world. I think the Thatcher maxim, there is no alternative. I think of that as the opposite of science fiction, right? Like my job as a science fiction writer is to think of 11 alternatives before breakfast. And Thatcher wants you to think that there is no alternative, which is another way of saying, don't try and think of an alternative. So I, I met Grover about 15 years ago. I was pitching my payroll tax holiday and I wound up in his meeting that he has with all his people around there. And I started giving this thing. It was a, large, it was a trillion dollar tax cut back in 2009. And they were just like in shock by this thing. They'd never seen anything like that. And they just dismissed it as being like, just too large for them to even consider. They, they were ridiculing everybody else. To talk to, for them, there was, it was about tax cuts, right? And so, <laughs> I, I, I out-tax-cutted the guy. <laughs> That's quite funny. I have, for my sins, I go to Burning Man every year. And I was in camp, and we have some friends who camp at First Camp, which is where the founders camp. And I had one of those friends come by, and she said, oh, I, I brought along this guy who's camping with us this year. I've just met him, and I'm showing him the ropes. His name is Norbert. And he said, no, it's Grover Nordquist. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to have to like sanitize our dirt now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. Unfortunately, Patricia's away for this episode, but I'm doubly privileged today to be joined by author and activist Corey Doctorow. Hi, Corey. Hello. Nice to be back on. And MMT founder Warren Mosler. Hi, Warren. Hello, and good to be back on as well. I thought it'd be great to get you guys in conversation because Warren, you gave the world MMT and Corey, you are the world's first, even though I know you're going to fight me on this, you are the world's first MMT informed sci-fi novelist. And, uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago, your latest book, which is a post Green New Deal solar punk novel called The Lost Cause came out. So let's talk about that. And if you don't want to fight me on my initial claim, Maybe you could start by telling us what year it is in the novel, what kind of America we find ourselves in. Yeah, it's set in the middle of this century. There's probably a year you could pin it down to if you paid close enough attention, but prophecy is bunk. And so if there's a year, it's just a convenience. This is about thought experiments, not building a timeline. There's a funny moment in my career where I was on a panel with Robert Silverberg, who's this grand old man of science fiction, very dry wit. And we were talking about Heinlein and the fact that he used to have these future histories on the verso of his books that would explain how all of his stories fit together. And Silverberg sniffed and said, oh, yes, uh, Robert, a timeline. <laughs> <laughs> so this is set middle of this century, and it's after a series of extremely contingent things have happened such that we are finally treating the climate emergency with the gravitas and urgency that it demands. And millions of young people all around the world are engaged in very heavy lifting. They're doing things like relocating entire coastal cities inland. They are solarizing, weatherizing, building new transmission and storage for power. They have reoriented much of their society around getting their material science right so that they can get their energy right. It turns out 
if you want to give everyone on earth the energy budget of a Canadian, which is like an American, but colder, you only need to collect 0.4% of the solar radiation that penetrates our atmosphere. So energy, if we do things right, is effectively not, if not infinite, extremely abundant, whereas materials are intrinsically scarce. New energy arrives every time the sun comes up, but new materials arrive only if a meteor actually like makes contact with the earth without burning up. And so it's about kind of reorienting things so that we trade energy for materials first to get a lot of solar and then to do a lot of the remediation work that it takes to move cities inland and so on. And after a half generation of this, you get the backlash, the counter-reformation. People who lose a just revolution don't dig a hole and climb inside and pull the dirt down on top of themselves. They fester with their grievances. And in this moment, there's been a reversal in American electoral politics, and it's fueled by two groups, a conservative coalition, very typical conservative coalition. On the one hand, you have billionaires. In this case, these are billionaire wreckers who have taken to the sea after the world's democracies have started to tax their wealth. And so they sort of circumnavigate the world's oceans in a flotilla made up of super yachts and cruise ships and decommissioned aircraft carriers trying to convince countries to start using Bitcoin. And then the useful idiots, the turkeys who vote for Christmas, are white nationalist militias in the U.S. were really angry that the transformative president finally passed some meaningful gun control. And that's turned out to be the culture war wedge issue that you can get them to really mobilize on in order to demand that the earth be made uninhabitable by humans. And the protagonist of the story is a, a young guy, Brooks Palazzo, whose parents were martyred by this new Green New Deal. They went to Canada to work on relocating Calgary, which is where it all sets off. And a zoonotic plague triggered by the loss of habitat and the invasion of species into human spaces kills them both. And he's raised by his reactionary grandpa in Burbank, California, where I happen to live. And he is about to graduate from high school and join the Blue Helmets and make the world a better place, just as the Counter-Reformation is threatening all of that. And this is really his journey. I wanted to just dive a bit further into the book in a minute. Warren, did you want to say anything at the top as a fellow author? Yeah, I got it a couple of days ago, and I got through the first chapter, and and so now I'm listening intently as to where it's going from there, so <laughs> looking forward to reading the rest of it. Okay, well, there's going to be spoilers in this interview, Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I think the political divide is laid out early on, and this will be in, in the bit that you read, Warren, in the prologue, I would say, maybe. Right, uh, right. There's a confrontation between Brooks and uh, a MAGA activist who's trying to wreck solar panels. And he makes a kind of public statement to Brooks because Brooks is live streaming. And it's all about the action he's taking and why he's doing it. Uh, tell us about that bit, Corey. Yeah, so the action opens with Brooks having outsmarted himself. He needs to sign up for a work duty at his secondary school. And so he says, oh, I'll take the overnight solar panel maintenance, which seems like a safe bet for never having to do anything. <laughs> Submarine but, washer. Yeah. But that's right, exactly. Then uh, fact checker for a Murdoch paper. Uh, <laughs> but he gets woken up in the middle of the night because the solar panels are malfunctioning in ways that they can't diagnose. And he goes up there and he finds a guy in a camouflage suit, smashing them with a sledgehammer painted in non-reflective black paint. And he actually recognizes this guy. It's one of his grandpa's cronies who has undertaken this terrorist attack on the school and he's prepared to die for it. And when Brooks starts live streaming it, which is the people of his generation just do when they get into arguments, they have a, a screen that's on them at all times and they hit a button and it starts live streaming and it plays this two-party consent announcement that says live streaming begun. And when the guy realizes he's now got a murder cam on him, he gives a little potted speech. And one of the things he says is that there's no such thing as money users and money creators. There's just takers and makers. And that if you allow takers to take over your government by allowing cheaters to enter your country without going through the immigration formalities. They will vote to redistribute the wealth of the makers and cause a collapse of society. And that all of this stuff that we're using to fund the Green New Deal is just going to indenture our children and their grandchildren and their great grandchildren. And it's nonsense. I hope what comes across is a very sincere panic. He's not mouthing empty platitudes. He really feels like he is watching the prosperity of his progeny down onto the fifth generation just gets siphoned away through a folly. Yeah, and, and there's some truth to that. And it's called the tipping point, right? Once you have more people taking than giving, 
then they get the vote and then it just spirals out of control. And that's what they're all scared about. Now, what the fear mongers do at that point is point out that less than half the people are paying federal taxes. And so the people not paying taxes are there so that we've already passed the tipping point. Well, of course, they leave out FICA taxes as federal taxes. If you include those, they're still like 75% paying taxes. They never mentioned that, even though I pointed it out about 30 times, right? <laughs> and so that is a legitimate story. The truth of the matter is we're not anywhere near there. It probably will never get anywhere near there based on any projections I've ever seen. And also, you've tried to spend a lot of your time since coming up with the core insights of MMT. You've tried to emphasize, look, it's it, it just is. It's not political, the way these balance sheets interlock and the way operations work. And, and, and it's we're trying to bring about a non-dystopic future here, aren't we, where we don't have this divide. Right. None of what I said has anything to do with MMT, but it's just another case of somebody fear-mongering with a lie, knowing it. And I know they know it because I've told them. Innocent fraud, Warren. I hate to quote you back to you. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Let me write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> well, and some of this book is about at least hypothetically red teaming some of the notions from MMT. So, you know, there's a widespread belief that I share that FDR made a mistake with his innocent fraud and that if he told people that social security was being paid for by money creation instead of by hoarding up taxes, that would have been harder for people to wrong foot him. And that's clearly true, but he didn't do that for no reason, right? Like he also understood that getting people to understand this nuance was going to be an uphill battle and that it'd be easy for his political adversaries to trick people. And there's another major element of this in the book, which is something I've taken up with Pavlina when I've spoken to her, which is that a locally administered jobs guarantee, while on the one hand could be very good, and I believe in both Hayek and Marx, that the people at the coalface know more about what's going on than the people in the central planning office, but we've seen how easy local capture of politics is. And we see that now with library board and education board takeovers by swivel eyed loons. And there's no reason to imagine like a priori that there wouldn't be people who would say, oh yeah, the jobs guarantee should fund a crony program for right-wing militias who need a clubhouse and want to get paid to sit around all day and complain about immigrants. Right. So two things. First, they called it a useful fiction, which is interesting because it's just flat out intellectually dishonesty, but they thought it would be useful. So they did that. And I'm not sure FDR understood it, but I know some of the economists did. And the second thing, that's why on the job guarantee, I say the, the purpose of this job guarantee is to promote a transition from unemployment to private sector employment. It's not to provide jobs per se. It provides jobs because the private sector prefers to hire people already working. And I think that neutralizes a lot of these responses. But you know, I just can't get the MMT proponents to see that nuance of why it's important to present it that way. I'd like to get that a little better. So unpack it again. Yeah. So what I say is, look, we have unemployment, which is the evidence that the government hasn't spent enough money so people can pay taxes and net save, which is technically, you don't have to know that, but it's because there's not enough spending. So we want to do two things. Look, first of all, we want to make sure the public sector has fully provisioned itself. There's no reason the public sector, if it wants what we call green jobs, can't just go out and hire those people. You don't need a job guarantee unless you're trying to get them at a discount, okay? And that's a horrendous implication that this hard-earned pay scale and everything else that public employees have gained over the years, hard fought with violence at times. All of a sudden, here we are, this coming in, this left-wing community is going to undermine it all by hiring people at $15 an hour and have $35 million of them doing jobs that should be regular public pay jobs. And it's just threatens and undermines the rest of the uh, public sector workers. And they're right. They're 100% right. So number one, any of these green jobs that I've heard anybody dream up, my response is, well, just hire them in the normal course of public employment. Why do you need a job guarantee for that? Pay them what they're supposed to get paid. Now, if once we've done that, if there are still unemployed, well, what are we going to do with those? We've already got everybody we actually want in the public sector. We've got to get them back to the private sector so that they're gainfully employed rather than being unemployed and not producing any real output. And nobody argues that the private sector doesn't produce real output. I mean, I could, but I, I don't bother. But uh, <laughs> none of the right wing ever argued that. It's the opposite, right? So the purpose of the job guarantee is once we fully provision government, where it doesn't want any more employees, it's chock full to what serves public purpose and let Congress vote on that. The rest, they don't want. So now we get those back in the private sector. And how do we transition them back? Well, the private sector doesn't like to hire people who aren't working. So we offer a job 
And the purpose of that job is to make them employable in the private sector. You measure the success of this program by how many of these people transition to the private sector. We want to keep the number in this transition job to a minimum, of course. It's an unemployed buffer stock. And it will probably it can be less than an employed buffer stock because right now we have 3.7% unemployment today. And these are people, the rest of them have been hired by the private sector, but reluctantly because they weren't working. And it takes a certain amount of you know, stress to do that. Well, once they're all working, much more employable, that number can be maybe 2%. And it can still be an effective buffer stock. Maybe 1%, 1.5 or 2 I think Japan's worked with a 1% to 2% unemployment rate and very low inflation. So we can get it down to that level. We can get many more. All those people who were unemployed can become private sector employees. And the underemployed and the marginally employed, transition them all to the private sector. And once you've looked at it as a transition to the private sector, you've got the right on your side. They're 100% in favor of that. I just can't get any of the academic community to lead with that statement. They always lead with, well, there's lots of useful work. They can redo infrastructure and green Java. It's like, wrong answer. They can transition into the private sector as private sector employees. The, the ones we want to do public sector work, we're just going to hire those at normal public sector pay. Okay, And they're not against it, but they won't use it as part of their dialogue, as part of their uh, narrative. I think that maybe they're worried that it's going to be harder to sell this to a paygo. So I had this conversation with Nick Jackson once from Tax Justice. And he said, look, I hear all the things you're saying, but you know what? It, like, We want to do this in Germany and there's a law in Germany about the kinds of deficits the state can run. And his point was, like, if you're saying that this is itself an urgent and important priority, if I can achieve that separate from also revising the law, which is also an urgent and important priority, but which can be decoupled, why not just undertake it as its own thing? Okay, so I propose this for Europe. And the name of the paper is, you'll like this, Maximizing Price Stability in a Monetary Economy. So you have to choose a buffer stock. Every you know, a monetary economy chooses a buffer stock. We use unemployment as a buffer stock. And this makes the case that an employed buffer stock is a superior price anchor. It promotes more price stability, less inflation than an unemployed buffer stock. And therefore, it should be used as a tool by the European Central Bank, who's charged with price stability. And of course, for them, these expenditure is not an issue, even over there. And it just, it's off balance sheet. It doesn't register as running a deficit or anything. And the paper goes through carefully showing how of all the buffer stocks you can select, gold, corn, et cetera, that an employed buffer stock promotes the most price stability. It's full of mathematical models. Professor Salipe from Calabria wrote it with me. It's published in a leading mainstream journal in 2017, and it's compelling. And it's there on a record, and none of the proponents will use it. And they get out in the weeds on all these other arguments where they have it right there, how this works. And with this, the ECB can meet their 2% target on a consistent basis through all kinds of economy. And as a byproduct, there happens to be full employment. But you just have to accept that if you want price stability, <laughs> a little bit ironically, right? And it just won't go there. And my other question is, where does the Civilian Conservation Corps and the unqualified success of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Sure, that's public sector employment. Just hire people to do that. You don't need a job guarantee. What for? Okay. Pay them, pay them 70000 a year or whatever they're supposed to get paid, you know? The thing that distinguishes this is not just the pay scale, but also the local determination. So is there a way we can talk about federal funding for local determination? We already have that. We have all kinds of, oh, the whole highway thing is... Federal Highway Program is matching funds for local governments. We already have all that. We have uh, yeah, all kinds of programs. We have open-ended programs like the military at one time anyway. They would take anybody who showed up. They don't need more, but they did. You know, so there's, there's, there's precedent. Someone pointed out online that the next time someone complains to you about how much money the post office loses, ask them to compare it to how much the military loses every year. Yeah, look, the thing <laughs> is, which is another major problem, which we can get into later, is the whole idea of public sector efficiency. You know, you got all these proponents saying, well, the public sector doesn't have to make a profit if it takes 20 people to make a kilowatt of power instead of one person. It's okay because they don't have to run. For it. It's not okay. You're using up your scarce resource, which is labor. And that could be doing something else, like curing cancer or teaching school or being in the military or having a legal system you don't have to wait six months for, right? And so there's like no discussion about this massive loss of productivity from some of these proposals. It's like, it doesn't matter. It does matter. 
It's your real standard of living that's at stake here. And so they lose to mainstream economists when they argue, and, and they should lose, because they're not making the correct arguments. Their only argument is we're not going to run out of money. Well, yeah, fine, but that's not the point here. In the defense of the sort of progressive MMTs, it's probably down to the audience, I would say, Warren. Like, I think we're treating different people differently, and a lot of the time we're talking to other people who would consider themselves progressive or on the left. And we want to talk about how we imagine the job guarantee playing out. I know that it's kind of the way you like to talk about it, Warren, is like the people in the job guarantee are transitioning. That's why I call it a transition job. That's it. That's all we need to say about it. Well, no, I don't say that. I, I say you want to lead with that. Yeah, fair enough. That becomes the measure of success. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. And so if you look at the uh, bill in front of Congress, that a group of MMT proponents put forth with people on the left. It's, it's got the same problem. It start, starts out with something like, and, and I'm not trying to quote exactly, whereas the right to work, the employment is a human right or the right to work is some kind of human right that is guaranteed. That's like the wrong thing to lead with. It's like, whereas we want to move the people who are on unemployment into the private sector to private sector employment, that's a whole different, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think the human rights argument is strong because many nations, including the US and the UK, signed up to the provisions in the Universal Declaration many years ago, and that's very explicit. Yeah, okay, that's fine. I don't disagree. But what I'm saying is, it, A, it doesn't work because that bill's sitting there with no co-sponsors going nowhere, which it isn't going to happen and for a good reason, okay? And yeah, maybe it's a human right, but we can't afford it. We can't do this. We can't do that. It's become an entitlement. And they're saying, we have a right to this entitlement. Well, first, you got to dismiss the idea that it's an entitlement. It's a cost. You know, it's a burden on the person working. You've got to go to work all day. It's not an entitlement. I remember when we had the Greek problem in Europe, and I was saying, everybody was talking about the Greeks are lazy and they don't work and all that. So how do you punish them? Well, have them all be unemployed. The whole irony of it is like <laughs> right there, nobody ever mentions it. So it's the same thing. Once you've framed it as an entitlement, which this does from the first sentence, now you've created all these barriers to anybody even reading the rest of it. Well, we'll get back to the book in a minute, Corey. No, I'm enjoying this. I mean, look, I think that there's plenty to say about the book, but a symposium that uses the book as a jumping off point for fine-grained points about MMT in which in this Socratic dialogue, I can play the idiot who doesn't understand any of it is great. <laughs> I'm 100% there for it. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Well, where was I jumping in there? Yeah. I, I mean, I was thinking, and this is, I think, from you, Warren, and I think this is a very powerful argument that actually, you know, the right to life... I mean, I think that's axiomatic, right? That we should not be putting things in the way of people getting to live, literally live, right? And when you tell the MMT money story, business cards, guy at the door with a machine gun, you're describing a system where we've gone, right, you cannot afford your right to life, your food, your shelter, unless you spend the tokens. And that's been imposed on you exogenously from outside. And in the evidence that the issuer of those tokens hasn't put enough of them into the system is unemployment. On the one hand, the state is being coercive by Im imposing a money system via taxation. On the other hand, it's doing it because it has a political mandate to deliver the public purpose. So it's kind of legitimized by that. Yeah. And then you could say it maliciously leaves people short. Exactly. It goes and burns their houses down. And, yeah. Exactly. And it leaves them short. And just a, a nod to Corey here, this is very well outlined in his piece called Money Like, which I'll link to in the show notes because lots of Moslerian insights there. But what I'm saying is the way you make that analogy with the guy with the gun and the business cards makes it very explicit that we're putting in your way a thing that you have a right to, which is like food and shelter. And um, we're putting this money system in between you and it. And then, like you just said, Warren, we're not going to give you enough. <laughs> we're not going to give the whole system enough for you to get that. Now, to me, that's the human rights argument that you're making there. And so, I still think the human rights argument is strong that like, the means to the money is a job. It is a strong argument. You get about 20 or 30% of the people. So, it's a very strong argument, but it's not going to happen. The question is, is the argument exclusive or additive, right? Is this a question of where you lead or is this a question of whether you make omissions in order to sell something that would otherwise be unpalatable? For me, it's the initial framing and then you definitely include the human rights aspect down the list. But I would lead with the idea that we're losing output. We're all being impoverished by 
keeping people unemployed rather than productive. And so the purpose of this program is to move people from idle unemployment troublemakers into gainfully employed good citizens in the private sector. Okay, that's what we're going to do. And somebody will say, well, what about all the public sector work? You say, we're going to fully provision the public sector at the same time. First, but they're going to be regular public service jobs, not this job guarantee thing. This job guarantee thing itself, per se, is to um, transition people back to the private sector so we can have everybody back gainfully employed. So the government will be spending enough to cover the need to pay taxes and to save, and that everybody then has a human right to access whatever, and which we strongly believe in. And here's how we accomplish that. So I think the economic argument is the one that gets universal acceptance. Look, I was in Paris for Jamie Galbraith's left wing communist buddies, economists. I made the presentation and they all loved it and supported it. Then two weeks later, I'm in Dallas at the Tea Party with all those right wing nutcases. They thought it was fantastic and we should do this. Okay. I know it gets bipartisan support when it's understood the way I just explained it. You do have to tweak the story for the different audiences though. Am I right? It was the same story. It was the exact same story, same slides. I had the same presentation. Right. Okay. Look, my payroll tax holiday that Obama, President Obama did was the only legislation I was told by his administration, maybe anybody else, that was passed on a bipartisan basis. Everybody, <laughs> both sides. Certain things will be bipartisan, and this is one of them. If we just let it be, instead of politicizing it at the introduction. You make it look like it's a political battle at the introduction when it's not. It's like running away from the police when you're not guilty. So I think what might be useful if, just in case anybody is new here, I brought up the guy with the gun and the business cards. Is it possible to just very quickly just say what that is, Warren, just in case anybody's new here, and then we can go on from there? Yeah. So the idea was, how do you turn litter into money? And I was in front of an audience, and I said, I held up my business card, and I say, uh, I need some things done after we all leave. I need the floor cleaned and vacuumed and whatnot with anybody. And I'm going to give you payment. I will, will pay you my business cards. Does anybody want to do that? And I say, I hope you say no, because you know this isn't worth it. And I said, now I'm going to add one more thing. There's a guy at the door who works for me. He's got a nine millimeter. And you can't get out of here without one of these business cards. I said, and now you feel something. Now there's something that you can actually feel, and that is unemployment. You are now looking for work, you, you're there like, how many hours do I have to stay to get one of those cards? You are now looking, desperately looking for paid work, okay? And you should be, you should feel the anxiety that having that guy at the door needing that business card creates in your body because this system we have creates an enormous amount of anxiety and all the greed and everything people talk about can all, I think can all be traced to this ongoing drain created by tax liabilities that just goes on forever and it creates a deep, deep anxiety. As you've said many times, that politicians prefer unemployment to inflation, basically. And uh, you know, it's less politically costly. So there's always this permanent pressure and we're always going to have to accept that there's this class of people. It's worse. The ninety percent who are working like the idea that the other ten percent are begging for jobs to fix their plumbing or their electricity or something else. When you have high levels of employment, it's, oh, this is awesome. You know, I can't get a plumber. I can't get an electrician. I can't get anybody to build a garage. You get great resignation nonsense. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a tough battle. So, step forward, the job guarantee. So, no longer do we have to create this tension by insisting that there must be a, a buffer stock of human beings having a rubbish life, being paid less than they need to live on, called unemployment. Now we can have a, uh, a pool of employed labor expanding and contracting to smooth out the business cycle. One important difference here, Christian, you can pay more for people to be employed because they have to sell their time. So what you pay them is the value you're putting on their time. When they're unemployed, in theory, they're getting paid for doing nothing. And then you're just redefining the currency down to zero. So paying people for paid work to buy their time ensures there's always going to be a value of the currency that will buy the entire GDP. Great. Okay. Yep. Good stuff. So then maybe we could go on to like, let's see if this fits with where you were going to go, Corey. It was more about this money-like essay of mine. And, and because the point of the money-like essay, I got into this thing where... um and I think this may be a familiar experience to people who are involved in it, who come at MMT from progressive politics. There are a bunch of people who say things about technology that kind of rhyme with the things that I say about problems of monopoly and of centralized control and surveillance and so on. But a really large tranche of the loudest people who say those things are into cryptocurrency. 
And it's bad tactics for my goal to make all those people feel stupid for believing in something stupid, right? It's, some of those people are potential allies. So I spent a lot of time just trying to figure out how to talk about this. And unfortunately, because cryptocurrency is a cult as well as a bad piece of economic thinking, the discourse gets very toxic very quickly. But in money, like one of the points that I was trying to make is that if you are offended, if you're a libertarian who's offended by the idea that government threatens to burn your hut down unless you find employment, think about how offended you should be with the idea of Web3, which is the idea that some people who made up their own coins are going to redesign the internet so that doing anything on it is going to require you to take the money you are making in order to stop your hut from being burned down and trade it for their funny money so that you can fill in forms on the web. And this is even worse. So let me just jump in there and clarify the, the non-funny money, the hot tax money that you're talking about. That's your state currency. That's what they would call fiat. And obviously then the Bitcoin, which is supposedly all similar tokens are free. That we've been freed from government interference and it's a decentralized ledger. Nobody's in control, which means everybody's in control somehow. And that's what we've got. Yeah. Well, I say the same thing that I say to people who like gold. It's like, Right now, you can buy and sell all the gold you want. Why would you want the government to interfere with that? And it's like the same thing with Bitcoin. Right now, you can buy it, sell it, and do whatever you want. Why, why is it important to you that the government use it? Just, you got it. It's yours. Do whatever you want. Yeah, so I, I don't see the problem. I just don't see the problem. <laughs> also, when they've had a good day with their coins, they go, well, my coin appreciated by this many dollars. So I had a good day. It's like... Right. So <laughs> yeah, nobody ever says my Doge coin is up on well, I guess maybe they say it's it's up on stable coins, but that's just another way of saying less reliable dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Well it used to be penny stocks, right? There's no companies behind them, but they'll trade at all kinds of prices all the time and people charts and trade them and make money on them and lose money. It's fine. It's gambling. So I, I don't pay a lot of attention to it. It's just another form of, you know, Las Vegas to me. I'm glad you brought the crypto aspect up, Corey, because in your money-like piece, first of all, you go through the money story as we've just sort of gone sideways into with the guy with the gun, and it's basically the MMT money and taxes story. But then you talk about how crypto doesn't really have a form of taxation that can legitimize it like the state does, except this one thing. Well, two things. So one is maybe someday we can redesign the internet so that you need crypto to use it. But the other one is if ransomware creeps steal all your data, you need to get some crypto. So they're the guys who are burning down your hut, right? They're like the non-discretionary liability that is being broadly incurred that requires that people do work for crypto. And there was a, I think it was on, I can't remember which podcast it was on. It might've been Planet Money, where they described the dance that normies have to do when their data gets locked up. So there's like a grandma whose entire family photo album is now being held hostage on her computer by some cryptocurrency weirdos. And she gets in touch with them and they're like, okay, because all these ransomware gangs, they now have these pretty advanced customer service departments because it's so hard to pay them, right? And so this guy has got this granny on the phone and he's like telling her where to find a convenience store with a Bitcoin ATM and how to scan the QR code after she feeds real money into it and then get that into a wallet and have that wallet effect a transfer to his own wallet so that he can steal her money and give her the unlock code. And it's funny because there are actually some parallels to tax collection, which I think thanks to the starvation of tax authorities tends to be quite unwieldy. Like, And that's quite deliberate. Your Grover Norquist often say it should be as hard as possible to pay your taxes. But I um, gave the IRS $185 yesterday to get my annual form that says I pay tax in the United States so that when European firms try to pay me, I can give them that and they won't withhold tax against it because they'll know that I'm paying tax here. And to pay that $185, the instructions on the form say, go to pay.gov, search for the name of this form, click the third link on that page, then click the pay now button, then fill in the following four details, then record the resulting confirmation code, except there's two confirmation codes, they don't tell you which one it is, and write them into this form, then mail the form to us through the postal mail. But not just to one address. If you're sending it by private courier, it goes to one address. If you're sending it by USPS, it goes to a different address. And this is very much like the grandmother trying to rescue her <laughs> ransomware codes. 
<laughs> there was a tweet doing the rounds every January when we have to pay taxes in the UK. And... Um, <laughs> And it's got that list of instructions. And then it gets down to like, there's a scroll buried in your back garden. Find it. <laughs> yeah. T- dance thrice wishes round a, uh, a crooked uh, church steeple on a full moon. And yeah, to yeah. the spirit that appears, incite the following invocation. Remember to lay down a circle of salt first. <laughs> yeah. So I, I met Grover about 15 years ago. I was pitching my payroll tax holiday and I wound up in his meeting that he has with all his people around there. And I started giving this thing, which was a large, it was a trillion dollar tax cut back in 2009, 2008. And they were just like in shock by this thing. They'd never seen anything like that. And they just dismissed it as being like just too large for them to even consider. They, they were ridiculing everybody else. To talk to, for them, there was, it was about tax cuts, right? And so I, I, I out tax cut it to guy. <laughs> That's quite funny. I have for my sins, I go to Burning Man every year and I was in camp and we have some friends who camp at first camp, which is where the founders camp and sometimes fancy rich people camp with them because that's how they roll. And I had one of those friends come by and she said, oh, I, I brought along this guy who's camping with us this year. I've just met him and I'm showing him the ropes. His name is Norbert. And he said, no, it's Grover Nordquist. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to have to like sanitize our dirt now. <laughs> I, pity I did not have a bathtub that I could shrink him and then try and drown him in. <laughs> but he, he understood exactly what I was saying, by the way. I went through the whole thing being a reserve drain and whatnot. And that, so he's just intellectually dishonest. He completely understood what I was saying. Water also wet. <laughs> so, yes, this is why people will say, yeah, we get it, we get it, but politics. Right. I can't talk to my people like this. They can't talk to their people like this. And that's kind of a theme that's coming up in this conversation, I think, Warren. Right. But what they can say, we need to get the unemployed back to private sector work. They love that. Mm. Okay. And the left likes it too. And they also like the idea that you're going to fully provision the public sector. And the right's okay with that because they're going to vote on that. They get part of that vote. And whatever they vote on, they do that anyway. And then the rest, Go to back to work somewhere else. So there's nobody against that. It's universal. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener. And we can't do it without you. And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty, and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. So I think this takes us neatly back to the novel because one of my theses is that narratives are under theorized as elements of political change. And that particularly like pulp fiction, science fiction is under theorized in this way. I had a novel in 2017, Walk Away, that was grounded in Rebecca Solnit's wonderful book, A Paradise Built in Hell, which is a book about how people actually behave in disasters, which turns out to be they behave quite well. They kind of pitch in and help each other. But we have this great story that I think is really derived from pulp fiction that when the disaster comes, you know, if a tsunami blows down your house, your neighbors are going to come over and eat you. And I think that's from the pulp writer's imperative to get as much plot in there as you can. And so if you don't have to choose between man versus man and man versus nature, and you can get a twofer, just do both. And one of the subplots of the story is that all of the people who are really angry about the Green New Deal have read a science fiction novel 
about how bad the Green New Deal is and how it's going to enslave them all. It's sort of uh, Ayn Rand crossed with uh, Road to Serfdom, crossed maybe with the left behinds. And they're all convinced that we are spending ourselves into penury. And it's not just because of political arguments, because of fiction that's done it. Yes. So on that topic, the power of narratives and stuff, with a view to sort of avoiding this, <laughs> the job guarantee as it plays out in your book, Corey, can you talk about that? Because it's basically possible to sort of like brigade the uh, job guarantee meetings, isn't it? And, and people who are holding to this story that the Green New Deal is robbing them somehow and stuff like that can take it one way and the progressives can take it another way. And there's this divide. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think that through the rise and rise of digital activism, we have seen how much discovering an unguarded flank in administrative procedure and taking up after it can score some temporary but significant wins, some of which can be made permanent. So Citizens United. Yeah, Citizens United. But I'm thinking also like of how progressives did this, right? When the Netroots was kicking off with the Howard Dean campaign, or when you think about Obama's campaign and its use of sort of digitally organized door knockers through his community server, these were effectively unguarded flanks in the institutions. And by bringing digital tooling to them, not even particularly sophisticated digital tooling, you could score these very big wins. And sometimes they could be quite durable. You get eight, eight years of Obama out of the Obama ground game that's moved by digital, but they're also not exclusive to you, right? And this is what we're discovering as reactionary elements discover small dollar crowd fundraising of the sort that AOC pioneered or digital organizing on forums of the sort that the Netroots pioneered, or moving into local meetings and local politics in a way that some progressives pioneered. These strategies, they don't have an intrinsically political valence, although we can, they can sometimes be so associated with a given political tendency that we can mistake them for being politicized in and of themselves. And, you know, Naomi Klein's book, the new one that just came out, Doppelganger, is quite good on this, in that it describes how it's almost, well, not just almost, it is disorienting to have reactionary forces adopt both the language and tactics of your own movement in a kind of, she calls it the mirror world. I call it, I know you are, but what am I politics? So I'm anti-racist because I want Harvard to stop discriminating against Asian people in order to let more black people in. I'm a feminist because I want to keep trans women out of women's bathrooms. I'm a whatever. There's a million versions of this. I'm an environmentalist because I'm worried that windmills are going to kill birds. And in the book, I'm describing this turning point where the reactionary movements have recovered from the great losses that they've made in this conversion moment where the Green New Deal takes off. And they're reasserting themselves and they're learning from progressives. And so they pack the public meetings where we figure out how to allocate jobs. And they're just like, okay, well, the jobs guarantee should be organized around funding quote unquote community groups that turn out to just be like sinecures for a clubhouse where white nationalists sit around and complain about racial minorities. But somehow that's like community service and outreach. And they want to get, and after years and years of trying this in small ways and getting a few of these jobs, they've organized a slate and they're going to try and get every single jobs guaranteed job allocated to them. And their feeling is kind of heads we win, tails you lose, because the worst case would be that this so discredits the jobs guarantee that it's eliminated altogether, which is something they'd be quite happy to see as people who are kind of deficit hawks and worried about public spending. So with that, Warren, I know this it's possibly not an area that you go into much, but I just wondered how you envisage th the job guarantee going down, you know, in reality, in terms of, you know, I envisage a bank of jobs builds up somehow. It gets compiled, a list of jobs in any given community, and those jobs are allocated when somebody shows up to the employment center. We turn the unemployment centers into employment centers and so forth. And so how do we make that equitable, you know? So my latest thinking, which is open for suggestions always, of course, as long as they transition to the private sector, what, no, that's, that's the important part, but is that you could allow qualifying nonprofits to uh, hire people at your $15 an hour or whatever it is in, in unlimited amounts, knowing these people are going to transition to the private sector. Now, what's a qualifying nonprofit? Well, that would be up to Congress and they'd have to decide what qualifies or not. And that's where you could get 
these political groups that they could qualify. But that then takes it out of the realm of locally administered, I guess, if it's Congress? Yeah, it would be administered by anybody except the nonprofit. But you could allow local governments to qualify nonprofits if you wanted to. But at this point, the public sector is fully provisioned. The local governments are fully provisioned already. They don't need more police officers or more teachers. They've already got the proper ratio in the classroom. They don't need crossing guards. They've got lifeguards who can teach guitar at the same time, whatever Bill wants. I'm good with all that stuff. Just for anybody who's new, you're talking about Bill Mitchell. <laughs> you're the co-founder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, teaches surfing and whatever. And I, that's good for the quality of life. That's why we're living, right? So I'm totally in favor of it, but I think it would be a regular public service job at sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year, whatever it is, not fifteen dollar an hour job guarantee where you're gonna lose a guy to the private sector. But whether the not if the nonprofits lose people to the private sector, they're already outside of what's considered normal public sector work. And so fine. It's not that big a deal, in other words. I've got a story about that qualifying nonprofit, if I can, Krishnan. So I was a delegate to the United Nations World Intellectual Property Organization on behalf of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a digital human rights group. And WIPO was one of those soft targets, the un unguarded flank. So WIPO makes these incredibly important consequential global policies, but the representatives from the kind of corporate lobby tended to be quite dumb, like just not good at their jobs because they didn't really face any opposition. And because the lobbying targets were really soft targets, right? Because in a UN forum, the majority of national delegates are going to be from the global South. And those people are not sending in their Geneva delegation copyright experts, right? They're sending like water experts and child health experts and agriculture experts. So they are, I mean, they're not dumb, right? But they're just not well-versed. And so they can be pretty easily lied to if there's no one around with disconfirming stories. And so when we started going to WIPO at the behest of uh, James Love from Knowledge Ecology International, we found ourselves just like in this place where people were just telling these like very easily debunked lies in ways that made national delegations very angry when they found out they'd been rooked and they were voting in favor of policies of ours and so on. And the rights holder groups that were there, which were like Pharma and the Motion Picture Association and IFPI, which is like the global equivalent to the Recording Industry Association of America, they started to characterize themselves as public interest nonprofits, right? They said, well, we are here not as industry groups. We are public interest nonprofits. We are here because we are interested in the public interest as it is served by the industrial entities we represent. And formally, we are all structured as nonprofits. So when we're doing, you say, the Access to Medicines Treaty, you have pharma characterizing themselves as being co-equal with something like the South Center, which is trying to figure out how to get vaccine waiver or uh, IP waivers for antiretrovirals for Sub-Saharan Africa during the AIDS pandemic. And it was amazing to watch how easily they were able to tie the leadership and not in part because the leadership was not operating in good faith. They were briefing for the industrial entities, but it was so easy for them to provide enough of a plausible story that they would be included in every opportunity where public interest nonprofits were given an opportunity to speak or even simple things like being given access to the photocopier at White Post so that you could copy your documents and hand them out in response to the day's bargaining with responses. We, we used to get indie media to translate our documents into like seven languages. We were the only people who had internet access in the room. No one else could figure out how to make it work. So we would like write notes in real time and have them translated by the end of the session and then have them photocopied and hand them out to delegates as they were leaving the meeting and stuff. And it was for a while that worked really well. And without a whole lot of work, these people were able to shuffle in better operators. The dumbbells who had been going to WIPO on behalf of pharma and the MPA didn't conceive of the counter strategies. They were really stupid, but there were smarter people and they just got shuffled in. I think in broad terms, what we're talking about here is state capture of these uh, processes. Yeah, institutional capture. Yeah, by well-moneyed interests. And so, yeah, the upshot is how do we defend against that? We have a good idea. How do we stop it being co-opted and used? Like you were outlining before, Corey, the tactics and the language of these progressive movements get kind of adopted <laughs> and the people on the other side become a very quick study and turn around and use it <laughs> in the exact opposite way. Yeah, and some of that is just red teaming it. And I think this is where narrative is useful. 
and thinking about how you would, like, how would your adversary pitch this? I've mentioned EFF a couple of times here, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where I've worked for about a quarter century now. And I sometimes rub up against our lawyers because like all want to write that something is so, so foolish, it's not even wrong, which is a thing that I think Feynman said. And they're like, we can't say that our enemies aren't even wrong because they're just going to quote that we said they weren't even wrong. And there are going to be people who are going to miss that quote. And we're going to be in trouble if we like, not just in the public discourse where, you know, that might not fly, but like in a court brief, say. So what cut us on this track was the idea of qualifying nonprofits for a job guarantee. And how do you decide what's qualifying or not, which is political. But in any case, it's going to be a $15 an hour job. And most of those people are making a lot more than that, right? That's not going to be material, I don't think, for their organization and their purpose. Sure. I, it's about things like retirees who are just getting an extra 15 bucks an hour to sit around on their butts and complain about immigrants. Right. So if you can set up a nonprofit and get Congress to vote it as qualifying or the agency they set up to decide that it's qualifying, more power to you. It's not, not going to be a big deal, right? It's not like now where somebody has a $5 billion tax loophole or something. It's going to be a lot of small change. and It's not going to be a lot because the whole thing isn't going to be more than 1% or 2% versus three or 4% unemployed today. So you're cutting the whole unemployment thing in half to begin with. And then you're looking at kind of tag end type of issues that can't get out of hands and can't be a material problem for the macro economy. Yeah. But it's in terms of this is where I guess the narrative comes in, right? Because if you can narratively discredit the project as a thing that is literally a joke, and if the project is one of the kind of the more material kind of rubber meets the road ways that people experience the Green New Deal on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Well, they're not doing Green New Deal. These are nonprofit employees. But if they're 2% and we used to have unemployment at 4, 5, 6, and 10, and now we've been at 2, so real outputs in the private sector and public has been way up for everybody, it's pretty hard to look at it that way, at what some individual might or might not be doing because they were already doing that before times 10, right? So you've cut 90% of the problem just by having a smaller group doing it. I don't mean to quibble with you, but I think that like, if the way that you make this thing work is by having people feel that the system is legitimate and effective, and that the way that you keep it legitimate and effective is by having them show up to the world's most boring town meetings to make sure that it goes on. And if they are like, actually, it's just bullshit. And who is this? uh, Who are you talking about? The people who constitute the political will for maintaining this program and preventing it from backsliding into- Well, there really isn't anybody. You're not going to have very many people administering it at all. You just have qualifying nonprofits. And it's- okay. If it's qualified, I mean, I'm thinking about locally determined. I'm still thinking in a Pavlina-ish way about local determination. That's why I don't really want to go there because it raises all these other issues that you don't need to have. Let me give you an example. These people are saying, well, we might start off with, there might be 30 million people take this job. What are you going to do with them all? Well- Within a year or so, that's going to be down to 2 million because the other 28 are going into the private sector. That's something you can understand. And then the idea of, well, what are the 2 million going to do? Well, we had 4 million unemployed doing nothing, and these people will be working for qualifying nonprofits. You got a goal, you got a plan, you got something to measure it by. If three years later you're still at 30 million, you failed. If you're down to 2 million in qualifying nonprofits, you've succeeded. So we have a metric to measure this thing by that everybody can understand and, and support. They want these people. They want these people off of the dole and onto private sector jobs or real public sector jobs. They don't want them in unemployment. You know, you don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. This has to be a lot better than unemployment that we have now. And here's why it's going to be. And business is going to love it, right? Because you got an economy now that's much stronger. I think, we, you know, if we've got a, just a little bit more time, wanted to just dig into a little bit more of Corey's recent writing. The, the reason a lot of us are MMT is, is because we want economic and social justice, Corey. And in your piece, social security is class war, not intergenerational conflict. You write about how the Republicans say they want to destroy social security for two reasons. First, to promote, quote unquote, choice by letting us provide for our own retirement by flushing even more of our savings into the rigged casino that is the stock market. And then second, because America doesn't have enough dollars to feed and house the elderly. And you go on to write, I mean, that's bad enough. (laughs) Those are standard, right? But then you go on to write about how the New York Times, for instance, has figured out a way to sell those two 
very mainstream economic axioms to liberals <laughs> through the language of social justice. Tell us about that piece. Yeah, this is very Naomi Klenish. And I'm just riffing on stuff that mostly that Robert Kuttner wrote in the American Prospect. But, you know, this is Naomi Klein's mirror world politics, where you have the New York Times saying, well, the problem here is that the boomers are hoarding all the wealth. They're all really rich. And that's why young people are poor. And that's why Social Security is going to go broke. And Kuttner does some like decomposing of those numbers on the net worth of boomers, right? And so there's two ways that you get misleading statistics about the net worth of boomers as a cohort in America. The first one is that there are a very small number of extremely rich boomers, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates among them. But the second is that you count the wealth that has accrued to boomers through housing appreciation, where all they've done is buy a house and live in it. And yes, that's made them very rich on paper, but of course, we all need a place to live. And if you were to expropriate them of that wealth, you wouldn't make anyone else better off, right? You would just make everyone worse off. We don't solve economic woes by making boomers homeless. We solve economic woes by giving everyone else a house. And that, in fact, might give boomers a haircut in terms of their paper wealth, because you know, if we had a, a reasonable stock of housing, then the nominal value of their homes might fall. But that's okay. And th that's the only way that we should be giving boomers a, a wealth haircut, the median boomer a wealth haircut, is by having so much housing that having a place to live does not constitute a source of permanent leverageable wealth. I think in that article, Corey, this sentence nails the problem, I think, with the non-MMT approach to economic justice. And you have the Democrats taking this line and we've in the UK, we've got the UK Labour Party taking this line. And it is, this is your quote, they insist that we can't have nice things until we make billionaires poor, which is the same thing as saying that we can't have nice things, period. And you say it's the opposite in, in the piece. Could you talk about that? Yeah, well, and you know, back to the novel, the, the, in the novel, one of the plots is that we have made billionaires poor, we have instituted tax on them, but it's to undermine their political power and secondarily their spending power, but not to fund programs. And the pago democratic self-limiting move of saying, unless we raise tax or cut programs, we can't do anything, depending on how cynical you want to be and how cynical you think they are has definitely created a circumstance in which much of the muscular policy that Democrats want to do, policy that would actually create the positive individual life circumstances that Warren has made so much reference to, that would give them credibility and possibly eke out the much larger electoral margins that they need to do even more muscular things. It's off the table because they just can't get the increases in taxes, nor can they sell the decreases in programs needed to fund these measures that they're seeking. And so they just do nothing and they get nowhere. And when you point this out, normie liberals tell you that you're being unrealistic and you're asking for the sun, the moon and the stars. Back to that Naomi Klein book, when I wrote my review of it, one of the things that I said is that Klein is really identifying a pathology that comes from having a, a liberal leftist coalition in which the leftists are the junior party. And you end up then with all of your council revolving around individual, not systemic action, right? Because the, the kind of the liberal idea of the individual as the, the most important unit of, of political and social change means that if you don't like the prospect that your kid is going to grow up having to drink their own urine when we run out of fresh water, then you should personally be like gardening your lawn less. Whereas there are seven incredibly wealthy families in Central California who have more water from the Colorado River than many states because of corrupt arrangements regarding senior water rights. And you can recycle lovingly all you want and you're not going to address climate change except at the barest margins and so on. And we see this in UK politics, especially if you really want an example of how it is that leftists making coalition with liberals can lead to heartbreak if you don't understand where their true allegiances lie. Look no farther than the 2010 election and the coalition government and the decision by the guy who's now getting millions every year to rep Facebook around the world, Nick Clegg, to go into coalition with David Cameron 
who's back as well. I mean, oh my God, uh, the pigs everywhere are terrified. <laughs> um, that's your proof, right? That this coalition, even if it's sometimes useful, and I think about Jagmeet Singh from the New Democratic Party going to coalition with Justin Trudeau and, and his liberals in Canada, it has to be viewed as fragile and dangerous, right? And always suboptimal. And in a two-party system, every party is a coalition. And so within the Democratic Party, that coalition is a leftist liberal coalition, and the liberals are the lead partners there too. And as the lead partners, they have hamstrung any kind of meaningful systemic change in favor of this individual stuff, right? And they one of the ways that they get there is through this idea of pay goes and our pay fors and that anything muscular that we want to do has to be paid for in tax or in cuts. And when people complain about it, they say, well, well, once we've tamed the billionaire class, we can do all the things that you want. And I think we'd have to tame the billionaire class, but you don't tame the billionaire class without the kind of giant electoral majorities that you will only get by delivering programs that make people believe that you have something for them. And so that they've tied their own hands. And I think cynically, you can say they did it deliberately. They don't mm, want that yeah, change. Yeah. When you look at the fact that it costs so much money to just be a political candidate, let alone a successful political candidate. And I think, I don't know if you've heard this before, Corey, but Warren had an idea about campaign finance reform. Do you want to tell us about that, Warren? Yeah, <laughs> it's not just me, but oh, okay. yeah. the idea, you, you can give any money you want, no matter who you are, to any candidate, but 40% of whatever you give just for a number, it goes to the opposition. Right. I've heard variations on this. Yeah. This is one of the things that cryptocurrency did was it actually like one of the good things it did was the DAO side of things spent a lot of time thinking about heterodox governance models. And this is one of them, right? Where like they do have this thing where you have anonymous shares in governance. Like even if it's one share, one vote, you don't know who owns the shares and one person could have a million identities and own a million shares through them. And so they resolve that with things like this. If you donate to one side, then a big chunk of it goes to the other side and so on. Sure, sure. And everybody I talk to is in favor of that. And yet it never even gets a hearing. Yes, I, uh, that actually surprises me, Warren, because I mean, until now, I've only ever really heard it coming from you, Warren. And every day people are saying, well, if you're an MMT or every day people are saying, yeah, the problem with you guys is you don't understand politics or you're not understanding the real situation out there. And, and I'm sure it's not just MMTers that get that, that you know, there's so much corruption. And harking back to something that Corey just said, you know, a lot of the time you get this kind of like, well, we just simply need to end corruption. And then our thing will work how we want it to work. Or some people will go, oh, we simply need to end capitalism. And then there'll be climate justice. They basically put this obstacle out there that where it's obviously impossible to take a back panel off the economy and find the switch that says capitalism on, off, and flick it to off. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We need to eliminate property rights. <laughs> yeah. Right. And yeah. look, I think yeah. that there are some things that maybe we should eliminate property rights. I do too. I do too. But it's a tough one to get anywhere with. <laughs> right. Well, and I think that you need a transitional program to it, right? You need to kind of poke a little fun at the creation scientists here. You need a use for half an eye. Right. And one of the things that I like about science fiction is it's not just a way of imagining a better world. It's also a way of imagining how we get to a better world. I'm thinking about books like Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future, which lays out a kind of plausible future history of how we get there. And it's not by way of prophecy. It's by way of kind of an imaginative unshackling. I think the Thatcher maxim, there is no alternative. I think of that as the opposite of science fiction, right? Like my job as a science fiction writer is to think of 11 alternatives before breakfast. And Thatcher wants you to think that there is no alternative, which is another way of saying, don't try and think of an alternative, right? Stop trying to imagine alternative, abandon hope all you enter here. And I think that imagining that we could find a way out of this, right? The quote variously attributed to different people, Zizek among them, that there, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. But imagining the actual end of capitalism, not just what life is like without capitalism, but how capitalism might end, unshackles the imagination and puts that in the domain of things that you might try and plan. Even if the fiction itself isn't the plan, it opens you up to the prospect of planning. And let me just point something else out. So the US has governments, maybe 25% of GDP spending. And so that means the other 75% is up for grabs. 
if that gets up to 50 or 60 percent like Europe, then only 40 percent is up for grabs. And that's a perfectly legitimate way of reducing what's left for capitalism, right? And although it can produce things for the public sector, fine, but what it actually can consume is only what's left over afterwards. Now, I know I put a lot of this transfer payments and everything else. I'm not trying to claim that it's a true 60%. But the idea that if you build your public services, then you're taking away what's left for private services, right? This the salt and fanner, so to speak, which is what I call a lot of the jobs out there. They now call them bullshit jobs. I used to call them salt and fanners. And so it's not the argument against big government, but underneath it, I think there's something to it. So anyway, I've always proposed just increasing the level of quality public services, medical, educational, legal system, everything else. I think this is a strong uh, thing that people who are advocating for degrowth, I mean, I agree with a lot of the ends of degrowth. And if I'm talking to a fellow degrowth fan, I will use the word degrowth, but really, and apologies, I'll probably end up talking about this in other episodes, but really you can put a heavy emphasis on what's actually going to grow. And there's going to be a huge growth in, it's got a number of names, but you know, universal public services. I think it's possible to focus on what you're going to get rather than, oh, degrowth sounds like a recession to me. One of the elements, economic elements of the novel is this thing that I call library socialism, which is a term I, I got from the Seriously Wrong podcast in uh, British Columbia. And their library socialism is just the idea, more or less, that you can check stuff out of the library, which sounds pretty anodyne. But I think about it in the context of my own life. I'm a homeowner in Southern California, and about three times a year, I got to make a hole in my wall. And so I own a drill I call the minimum viable drill, right? Because there's just like no economic case for owning a better drill than that. But <laughs> it's like the most remarkable thing about this drill is that it doesn't turn into shrapnel and kill me every time I use it. And it is a cost center for me, right? Like I have a drawer with a drill in it and then I have a drill that doesn't work very well. And like I compare owning the minimum viable drill to backpacking around a developing country in the global south where everywhere you go you have to carry your own roll of toilet paper and you are not richer for living in a society in which everywhere you go you have to have your own roll of toilet paper instead of having just an environment in which toilet paper is sort of stochastically distributed in the places where it's most likely to be needed and not metered at the point of consumption. Oh, mate, you have been captured by big toilet paper. <laughs> I, I certainly have. Well, substitute bidets here, but I don't know how you would carry around a bidet. But the point is that if you had a sort of cloud of drills circulating around your neighborhood that were designed in non-market ways that prioritize things like graceful decomposition back into the material stream rather than optimal low-cost manufacture, you get into a world where you can satisfy the degrowth vision of using less material, using less energy, needing less space individually, but also a world in which no one is like oh, I guess this isn't my week to have toilet paper. Dang it. At least we're saving the planet. Like, I think these are completely compatible programs. No, no, I like the idea. You know, they have two rental places, but I prefer that to owning the things. So. Yeah. And, you know, see also like everything else that you own that you only use periodically, like the dishes you bring out at Christmas and the, the lawnmower that you use six times a year. And your house is just full of this stuff and none of it is good. Yeah, you could have a reciprocal arrangement with people from other faiths that you know because they're not going to need the dishes at christmas that's right you need ramadan hanukkah <laughs> christmas tri-denominational yeah. extra dishes and then you could just shuffle them around well you know cities are a lot more resource friendly than people spread out right Sure. Yes. And, you know, this is another thing that's going on in the novel is that there's a lot of urbanization because one of the ways that you leave a lot of habitat for animals, which is a good unto itself, but also a way to avoid getting zoonotic plagues and being locked indoors for three years and scrambling to get N95s, is to not turn animal habitats into places where people live. And so there's a lot of energy. And this is a very live issue here in Southern California, where we're very committed to single family housing and where also people's like entire source of wealth and their plan for not dying in poverty is the continuation of the single family house and the single family house zone neighborhood. Just to circle back to the theme of the book, our future possibilities, apologies for the big question. What might 
some ways be or even just one key way to bring about a non-dystopic if that's a word <laughs> non-dystopic ecologically and just sustainable economy so i'm going to go narrative here and i always like to take ideas from my enemies when they're good i think that's a thing the right is actually better at than the left and my arch nemesis is of course milton friedman and I think often of Milton Friedman's answer to people who would say like, Milton, how are you going to convince people to go back to being forelock tugging plebs and reverse the gains of the New Deal and the post-war welfare state? They all like that stuff. And he would say in times of crisis, ideas from the periphery can move to the center. So our job is to keep good ideas lying around so that when the crisis strikes, the impossible can become the inevitable. And we just don't have a lot of stories about what we should do when the crisis strikes. And if there's one thing we can foresee absolutely in the coming times of the climate emergency is lots more crises. And so having plans for weathering the crisis that don't involve becoming shuds with a militia that see off the marauders who come to town. And in my book, Walk Away, I talk about the difference between people who are convinced that their neighbors are coming over to eat them versus the people who are convinced their neighbors are coming over to use up the contents of their deep freeze with a communal barbecue and how you greet the former with a shotgun and the latter with a covered dish. So if we have lots of covered dish stories, that doesn't solve the problem. But it does mean that like when the crisis strikes and we advocate for things that are better, we're not starting from scratch. We're not trying to convince people that better things are possible. We're just trying to convince people that this is the moment where the better things should be deployed. And Satan took Milton Friedman to hell in 2006. And I like to think that when he hears his words coming out of my mouth, that he gargles a curse around that red hot iron bar <laughs> protruding from his gob and the demons turn the spit faster. But like, he was right. We are living in the world created by that theory of change. And so we could do worse than to embrace it. And Warren, last word to you. I'll let Corey have the last word there. <laughs> <laughs> but what I do agree with is that we're not going to do anything preventative. Whatever is going to happen to us and we're going to have to deal with it. Crises precipitate change. All right. That's where we're going to have to leave it. I've been talking to Warren Mosler and Corey Doctorow, and I'll link to all things Warren and Corey in the show notes for this episode. And of course, to where you can get hold of Corey's latest book, The Lost Cause. And congratulations on the audio book, by the way, Corey. It's fantastically read. You do a, such an amazing job there. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it's a national bestseller as of this week in the United States. So it hit the USA Today list. Well, congratulations. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely worthy. And I'll also link to where you can find out more about the 2024 Scotonomics Festival, which takes place on the 22nd to the 24th of March in Dundee, Scotland. No matter where you are in the world, you can attend the sessions in real time because they'll be streamed live. Speakers include Steve Keen, Dirk Entz, Anne Pettifer, Danielle Gabor, Clara Mate, BBC Economics correspondent Andy Verity. If you want to take your understanding of MMT and heterodox economics to the next level, Modern Money Lab is running online graduate and postgraduate courses taught by the cream of MMT lecturers. Classes start again in February 2024. I'll be there. I hope to see you there. So there's a link to more about Modern Money Lab in the show notes. Finally, for our Patreon subscribers, there's a link to all our patron-only episodes, including a bit of light entertainment from me and an episode with Dr. Sam Levy about economics in the movies. So check out the show notes for all of the above. But for now, thanks so much for joining me today on the MMT podcast, Warren Mosler and Corey Doctra. Thanks, Christian. Thanks. That was the MMT podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N Pino, and you can email us at MMT podcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening. And we hope to hear from you.